stay tuned because for the next 60 minutes, Motorsports Unlimited is on the air. Hi, I'm Jerry Bryant, and these are the lovely ladies of Motorsports. And all this hour, we're going to have 60 minutes of action-packed excitement. All kinds of exciting things will happen. And we got the famous Bill Wilt, and we got all kinds of other good stuff that's happening all this hour. Motorsports Unlimited, 60 minutes of nonstop action. So let's go to the studio right now, huh? Thanks, Jerry, and hi, everybody. Welcome to the studio headquarters of Chicagoland's most watched, most talked about access television series. I'm Bill Wilt, and this is the 1,416th edition of Motorsports Unlimited. Today's show is titled Explanation 10 and is the 10th episode in our series within Motorsports Unlimited meant to explain what Motorsports Unlimited is all about and has been all about. We've been on the air for some 31 years, and I assure you it wasn't just to show you beautiful cars and pretty girls, although that's certainly part of it. Actually, while I said on the air, I didn't really mean on the air. It's just television talk. Motorsports Unlimited is a cable show, as like 99% of all Americans, we are not allowed to use the airwaves. I guess we say on the air because it makes us feel good, and people do see our work on the same television set that brings them broadcast television, the folks who are on the air. Thinking we are the same is a common mistake. Anyway, if you've been following this explanation series within Motorsports Unlimited, you know how I feel about these things and probably also know how to get back to it again and again. On this episode, I promised to continue the story I started on episode 9 about my 30 years ago experience with 501c3. 501c3 is an important contributor to the loss of motorsport in America, and I'm going to continue the saga today. In addition, I also promise to show you where the money is and how to dig for it. <laughs> what I'm talking about is the reality that all racetracks close for the same reason. They fail to generate enough revenue to fund themselves and flourish. Thus, if we are to save them and rebuild the motorsport community, it's going to take money. We must identify where the money is and how to get it. You see, as I said before, we live in a capitalist system, and those things that don't generate enough revenue to fund themselves die, except those things that exist on handouts. And that brings us back to 501c3. In the last episode, I outlined a bit of 501c3 history and purpose, and I think I left you hanging as I was trying to get the lawyer I hired to handle our 501c3 application to actually do something. You'll recall I stupidly gave him $500 in advance to take care of making application. Yeah, I, I know, it was stupid. Now I know it. At the time, he certainly seemed to know what he was doing. I remember asking him how one goes about funding a 501c3 if these foundations I'd looked into don't step forward to help. While I was poking around at the library, I really hadn't seen any that focused on our dilemma. He mentioned something about fundraising events and, oddly, selling t-shirts. I thought it was odd because when he said it, I had a flashback to my youth when the bar I frequented was being hurt by the local church's monthly Vegas nights. you remember, I told you about it in episode 9. Anyway, I told him somewhere out there is a, some person who has a business that pays taxes and paid for a business license selling t-shirts. Motorsports Unlimited t-shirt sales would certainly hurt them, wouldn't it? Then he said something very weird. It depends on how much you do. I thought at the time it was hopelessly vague. I mean. What does that mean? If all you do is hurt some poor little small guy trying to feed his family selling t-shirts, it's okay. But presumably, if you hurt General Motors, you're in trouble? I mean, if Motorsports Unlimited becomes an entity that doesn't pay taxes and is supported by tax-free donations, it doesn't seem fair to the real business person to compete with them. Depends on how much you do was odd indeed and seemed to imply as long as you don't hurt anyone with resources to fight back, you were okay. I didn't like it, but I figured I'd come to understand it as I went along. The point was, I really didn't want to spend my life on it. A couple of years of pointing out what was going on ought to do it, and I could get back to my real work in a healthy economic environment. At least that's what I had in mind. I didn't need to become an expert on 501c3. After all, 
How hard could it be? I just wanted to educate the public about the broadcast industry and its responsibilities and obligations. I wanted to point out how the broadcast industry had failed to live up to its legal obligation to serve the public interest, at least as far as the community of which I am a part is concerned. I wanted to point out that a law conceived in 1927 when television didn't exist should not be controlling an industry that now has more power than nuclear weapons. <laughs> yes, that's what I said, <laughs> nuclear weapons. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know what nuclear weapons are and I know how they work. And yes, they have near unimaginable power. And that's really their Achilles heel. They are so powerful, one can't use them. Come on, what would be the value of using weapons that would ensure our planet would no longer be habitable? Talk about winning a battle and losing a war. That's not the case with television. I've often said if I were a military planner, given the task of planning the invasion of a country, my first target wouldn't be their Army, Navy, or Air Force, assuming they had those things. I'd take over the broadcast facilities first. Then I'd announce the war was over and we were the victors. If no one else was allowed to talk, the war would be over without firing a shot. Thus is the power of television, particularly when no one else is allowed to use it. We've been living with television since the mid-50s, and it's changed America in every way. Its power is staggering. Yet, we don't seem to feel a need to ask the question, who gets to use it and for what purpose? I truly hope someone is listening. I may be part of the last generation who remembers before television, and I have an important message that should be heard. Television is the perfect weapon. It has no sharp edges, it's bright and colorful, it floods us with delicious sounds and compelling pictures. What's not to like? Almost everyone loves television, me too. It wakes us up in the morning and starts our day, it provides us with world-class entertainment throughout the day and into the evening while also informing us about the world outside. And finally, we set the sleep function and it puts us to sleep. How could it not influence you? Speaking out against television would be a lot easier if it were menacing in appearance or made objectionable sounds. It doesn't. It's the perfect invader. And truth be told, television as a technology isn't the problem. The problem is only a privileged few get to use it. Oh, if you're thinking, wait a minute, Bill, what about PBS, Public Broadcasting System? Despite the name, there is nothing public about PBS, unless you count the fact that the public gets to pay for it. I hate to criticize because on occasion they have done some exceptionally fine work. I suppose they do just enough to maintain their 501c3 status. And when they do, they have done some excellent work. On the other hand, my observation is they generally just do more of the same, more of the big three commercial networks, except a little snobbish. You know, for people who like to look down their nose and say, I don't watch much television. <laughs> They're usually comfortable saying they watch PBS thinking there is something more serious about it. <laughs> there isn't. Of course, you don't have to take my word for it. If you think they are public, call them and see if they are willing to allow you to participate in their broadcast. Don't be fooled by deceptive names. In my view, public broadcasting is no more public than NBC, ABC, or CBS. Give it a little thought. I have. In my lifetime, I've seen several major Chicago area motorsport facilities close. O'Hare Stadium closed in 1968. Santa Fe Speedway closed in 1995. Raceway Park closed in 2000. Even Soldier Field operated as a stock car track in the mid 50s. All are gone, all are gone, without mention of their passing on NBC, ABC, or CBS local telecasts. And what about PBS? The public broadcasting system? No mention of these closings there either, or the consequences of these closings. More of the same of the big three commercial networks. Public broadcasting system. I know, I'm the public. I'm part of the motorsport community. We're part of the public, yet we are ignored by NBC, ABC, and CBS, and I suppose that's why we are ignored by PBS too, because they are little more than more of the same except with an elitist attitude. I'm sure we'll get back to all this as we continue to explain Motorsports Unlimited and its objectives, and I don't want to allow myself to be distracted by details, as I so often do. On the other hand, I do want to take just a moment to tell you something you may not know, certainly not from television. I am ever mindful of the fact that at 74 years old, I am part of the last generation to remember before there was television, 
And when we're gone, these little historic vignettes will be gone forever because television ignored the motorsport community and nothing was recorded. I want this recorded. When I was a teenager in the late 50s, it was commonplace for those of us who were interested to participate in the then new motorsport of drag racing. Drag racing started in the early 50s. There were three drag strips in the Chicago area, although I hate to say Chicago area because the closest was 35 miles away in Oswego, Illinois, directly west of Chicago. Not exactly Chicago, but it's all we had. Anyway, every Sunday, those of us so inclined would make the trek to the local drag strip to participate. If you lived north of Chicago, in all likelihood, you went to the Grove. That's in Union Grove, Wisconsin. If you lived on the south side of Chicago or south of Chicago, you went to US 30 drag strip in northwest Indiana. If you lived in the middle of Chicago, you went to Oswego. It wasn't really a track preference thing, it was geography. We tried to cut down travel time as much as possible, so north siders to the Grove, middle Chicago to Oswego, and south siders to US 30. It was a Sunday ritual and very important to gearheads. For me, it was Oswego. I could get there in about 45 or 50 minutes. The Grove was an hour and 15 minutes away, as was US 30. I won my first trophy at Oswego Drive Strip. I still have it today. It was very important to me. The Grove, by the way, is still in operation. Oswego closed in 1976. US 30 closed in 1984. The closings and their consequences went unnoticed and unreported by NBC, ABC, and CBS local news telecasts and, of course, more of the same, PBS. I interject this small piece of history because I, I can. It's my show, and as I said, I want it recorded. Baseball, football, and basketball history is well known and well recorded. Let it be known, we were there too. Now let's get back to 501c3. Yes, 501c3. What started out to be a simple application to participate in something everyone around me seemed to be doing was turning out to be a royal pain in the butt. I was $500 and months and months into it and still had nothing to show for my efforts. My trips to the lawyer's office were huge time wasters and were getting closer to physical confrontation. I was in no position financially to be dangled on the end of the string and that's what it felt like. I started this for a couple of reasons. First, as an effort to fund a program to educate the public about the broadcast industry and what was happening to a portion of our population because so few knew what the laws were and who was supposed to enforce them. While speaking on the subject, I can tell you the number of times people would look at me with blank expressions as though they just landed from another planet. People didn't know broadcasters had to be licensed by the government in order to broadcast, and they didn't know these broadcast licenses had to be re-upped continually and that it was possible to object to a license being renewed. When I would talk about the public's right to question broadcasters about everything they do, from the amount of time devoted to commercials to the content of the programming, I was met with blank stares. They truly didn't know. On occasion, these discussions would become heated, and I would ask, have you ever raised your voice in objection to anything they do? Like ignoring the motorsport community while granting free promotion time to our competitors for public attention? Have you ever even raised your voice in objection? Of course, they hadn't. Worse, they didn't even know they could. They didn't know those who get to broadcast did so only with their permission and standing silent is tacit authorization. It was nearly impossible to get people to understand the airwaves belong to them, the people. That's why they're called the public airwaves, because they belong to the public. Of course, we can't have a quarter of a billion people going to Washington to decide on programming. We elect representatives to go to Washington and, in our names, decide how it's going to be done and as usual, they duck the responsibility as soon as they can and create a regulatory agency, the FCC in this case. Personally, and I've read the Constitution backwards and forwards, I don't see any constitutional basis for regulatory agencies. But that's what we have. And when that agency becomes an empty office, our representatives don't even know. They don't know they're in charge of it and can control its operation. It is hard for me to believe we don't approach this thing called broadcast with the same seriousness that we approach nuclear weapons. The broadcast industry influences every part of our lives, every minute of our lives, yet we never ask, who's supposed to be watching them? 
it sure seems to me the people have a right to know how it's supposed to work and how their voice can be heard. As I understand it, that's what 501c3 is for, to teach them. Yet, here I was, months and months into the process, not to mention all the money I had, with nothing to show for it. And getting into a physical confrontation with a lawyer sounded like a good way to make my life miserable for years to come. So, I waited. In the meantime, I continued with Motorsports Unlimited as a way to raise public consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of the motorsport community and its activities. The second part of what I wanted the public educated about, and the less controversial part, certainly I knew challenging the broadcast industry was going to be heavy lifting, but showing people the work of which the motorsport community is capable was equally important. We had been so long in the shadow of baseball, football, and basketball at all, the public had no idea what we do, why we do it, and why it was important. For now, I was concentrating on that portion of my mission. It was tough without funding, and I'd hoped 501c3 status would change that. But by now, I was starting to doubt it. I doubted it would help at all. First of all, my study of fund-granting foundations did not encourage me. I'd learned the reason you see television ads that tear your heart out like the work of children's hospitals and sick kids. This is done to loosen the purse strings. It's called the pity factor. It's an effective way to get the people and foundations to consider their requests for funding. It works on me. I'm a big animal lover, and if I had any money, I'd be donating every time I saw a spot about animals in need. It was difficult to envision anyone being concerned about the loss of the motorsport community. There was no pity factor. In fact, I'd pick sick kids, puppies, and kittens over us anytime. Based on what I'd seen, I didn't think we would be competitive with other worthy causes in raising funds. Our effort was important, to be sure, but it wasn't the kind of thing that would attract sympathy, and from what I could see, that was the key to attracting funding. The financial situation at home was becoming critical. It was clear I had to do something, or Motorsports Unlimited could not continue. It may not look like it, but it takes money to do this. I had to think of something. As I just stated, I was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the notion of 501c3. It wasn't just the lawyer's inactivity getting on with the application. It was more uh, conscience-driven. As I examined 501c3, I couldn't avoid the conclusion that 501c3 was one of the things killing the motorsport community. Is it really right to become part of what I saw as the evil that was in part destroying us? It was a question I couldn't help but ponder. I thought about the local bar story I mentioned previously. You know, the bar I frequented as a young man that was being hurt by the neighborhood church's Vegas nights. It was more than that, though. The lawyer's response to my question about fundraising via selling t-shirts and who it hurts, he said, it depends on how much you do. That was months ago, and I'd had time to research it a little bit. Uh, that meant going to the library. There was no internet back then. I was mentally expanding on the thought, it depends on how much you do. Hmm. But while I was thinking about it, I was looking around and noticing some things I hadn't paid much attention to before. Television was exposing me and everyone else to something called college sports. Seemed innocent enough. College kids playing football, baseball, basketball against kids from other colleges. But then I started hearing stories about the college football coaches being paid in excess of a million dollars a year. Now, wait a minute. Where does that kind of money come from? I mean, we constantly hear about the need for additional school funding and the difficulty schools were having making ends meet, you know, paying for books and teachers' salaries, etc. Having been a homeowner since I was 21 years old, I was well aware most of my taxes go toward education. <laughs> they tell you on the tax bill. So how was it the schools were in a position to pay football coaches millions of dollars a year? It didn't make any sense. Somewhere along the line, while chatting about this bit of financial magic, someone produced a ticket from a college football game. I don't remember the college or the price of the ticket, but I do remember vividly printed on the ticket was the word donation. I thought it was odd. Donation. Did you have to have a ticket to get in? I asked. Yes. Huh. Then how is it a donation? 
Well, I don't remember the price on the ticket or the school, I do remember the word donation, except you couldn't get in to watch without a ticket verifying you made a specific donation. I wondered how this was any different than a ticket one would buy to go to a Cubs game or a Bears game or an auto race at Raceway Park. Sort of a peculiar twisting of the English language, and I was just suspicious enough to make further inquiries as time went by. Oh yes, while making inquiries, someone answered my question about how colleges could pay a college football coach a million dollars a year. It seemed to be common knowledge that the college football programs pay for themselves. Huh? Pay for themselves? How could that be? They were part of a school. They don't manufacture a product or sell a service. Where did they get the kind of money it takes to pay college football coaches a million dollars a year? Oh yeah, Bill, you just don't understand the kind of money colleges derive from college sports, especially winning teams. If they're selling tickets at $20 a crack and they have a stadium that holds 60,000 people, that equals $1,200,000 of revenue for one game. And don't forget, tickets for major schools go for a lot more than that. Of course, the real money is in television rights. Ticket sales are chicken feed compared to television money for the big schools. Oh, and don't forget about the concession revenues. I was stunned. While I and people like me were working in our shops and garages trying to figure out the secret to avoid piston ring flutter at high RPM to prevent brake mean efficiency pressure loss, the rascals had been busily at work cheating us out of a fair opportunity to compete for public attention. <sighs> Let me back up a little. In an earlier episode of this explanation series within Motorsports Unlimited, I provided a brief, rough outline of what it takes to open a racetrack for motorsport activities. I don't want to go through it again. Uh, you have to watch every episode. But if you remember, I want you to compare with what it takes to put on a college football game. First, you need a stadium. Well, they already have that, paid for by the taxpayers. Then you need players. Again, they already have that in the student body. Suit up some of the bigger, stronger alpha males and you're ready to go. Not only do you have to not pay them, ideally, they pay to be there. Now you have to make a show out of it. So how about a brass band from the school music department? The instruments are paid for by the taxpayers, as are the music instructors and the uniforms. Throw in a little TNA from the fairer members of the student body, you know, cheerleaders, and you have a first class show without spending a dime of your own money. It becomes very easy to see how they can spend millions of dollars on a football coach's salary. I couldn't help but think of my lawyer's words. It depends on how much you do and wonder how this fits in. So what's the big deal, Bill? Everybody wins. The schools make money. The football players have a chance at the NFL. Everybody wins. No, everybody doesn't win. When an entity like this enters the sports entertainment marketplace, they do so at the expense of the other competitors in that marketplace. When they decide to sell tickets and television rights, they are taking that revenue out of the sports entertainment marketplace where there are legitimate competitors paying dearly to compete for public attention. You know, the competitors who have to buy the land for their facility, then pay to build a facility to house their event, they pay to promote their activity, all the while paying for business licenses and permits and legal fees to be allowed to operate. You know, this is tough for me because my review of the history and purpose of 501c3 is something I support. We need libraries, medical research, and schools, and other things already discussed that have no way of generating revenue and couldn't exist without 501c3. Yet, I can assure you, when 501c3 was created, no one ever imagined 501c3s ever becoming multi-billion dollar competitors in the sports entertainment marketplace. And, given their tax status, no legitimate tax-paying entity can compete and thus they, like any entity in a capitalist society that fails to generate enough revenue to fund themselves and flourish, they die. That, in part, is what happened to us. Everybody doesn't win. Now the question was, do I want to become part of what was revealing itself to be a twisted, perverted system to fight for our existence? It was clear to me that every ticket sold to people to attend a college sport activity was a ticket that could have been sold at the local auto racetrack, 
It's really that simple. All of these entities are competing for the public's entertainment dollar, and it seems to me they should be all competing on a level playing field. It's not an unreasonable expectation or demand. You see, as I just said, those entities that don't generate enough revenue to fund themselves and flourish die. In the case of motorsport, we were killed. Yes, killed. Except there are a few of us too dumb to lay down and too determined to give up. We were looking for an angle to challenge those things that were killing us, and 501c3 seemed like a way to do it. After all, they were hurting us, so it seemed reasonable that we should be allowed to fight back. The question was, would we be allowed in? I did what I could to gain entrance and now had to wait. The problem was, I really didn't have time to wait. Having discovered this public access cable television opportunity, this was 30 years ago and cable was new, I felt it was our one chance to get our community in front of the public. Unfortunately, as I've already explained, keeping public access cable television was almost a full-time job. Fortunately, 30 years ago, I wasn't old and broken and was blessed with an exceptionally high energy level balanced with a strong sense of fair play. I wasn't about to let it go, and I wasn't about to give up trying to get the general public to have a consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of the motorsport community and its activities. Despite that bravado, I was well aware we could lose public access cable television regardless of how hard I fought to keep it. The old axiom about money talks and bullshit walks was in play, and I knew it. Cable companies were getting richer and carrying greater influence as each week went by. They didn't want public access. It cost them money. And they had money and influence. We had nothing, except, at the time, the law. Unfortunately, I wasn't 25 anymore, and I'd seen money and influence top the law more than a few times. I fought as hard as I could to keep public access cable, but we were losing it all over the country. And one would be a fool not to at least consider the possibility that it could be over soon. While I was aware I had to be patient about this 501c3 thing, I was also aware I didn't have time to be patient. I sure didn't want to miss this public access cable television opportunity. I felt the need to make hay while the sun was shining, so to speak. I was envisioning patiently waiting for several years for 501c3 status so I would have funding to work with, only to acquire the much sought after 501c3 letter and learn there was no public access cable television anymore. We missed our chance. That was something I couldn't let happen. I decided I had to find another way while I was waiting. For the first few years of Motorsports Unlimited, I paid for everything myself, but I was becoming aware there were some ways to generate revenue from it. While we were not allowed to have commercials, we were allowed to have 10-second spots at the end of the program identifying who had provided funding for the program. The rules were narrow and strict. There was no product promotion allowed, no exact addresses, no telephone numbers. In fact, we were provided with the exact words we were allowed to use. This program made possible in part by support from, and then a blank space for the name of the company. No picture of the company or entity, or endorsement of product or services, just a simple line clearly identifying who provided support. It wasn't much, but it was something. Motorsports Unlimited was becoming popular, and occasionally people were asking me about advertising, to which I always responded, we can't do that. People really didn't get it. They were used to seeing commercials on television and thought our little low-budget effort might be something they could afford. And, I like to think, they liked what we were doing and wanted to be part of it. I gave it some thought and said to myself, if it were cheap enough, perhaps we did have something to offer. I prepared a whole speech about the fact that we weren't allowed to advertise, but we could provide an underwriting acknowledgement. I was fond of saying, we can't do much, but it doesn't cost much either. I explained it costs money to do this, and we were allowed to accept funding to cover our expenses, but Motorsports Unlimited wasn't a commercial enterprise, and what they saw on commercial television wasn't something we could offer. Surprisingly, at the time, businesses weren't really interested in tape costs or our expenses or the words underwriting acknowledgement. They just wanted to know how much. I took a chance and valued the underwriting acknowledgement at $50. I think I hit the number about right. I had a few takers, starting with ABC Auto Parts. Let's talk about ABC Auto Parts for a moment. They were with us first and have been with us the longest. Even though it was 30 years ago, I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> yeah, 
At least I think I do. I just turned 75 a few days ago. I hope I remember it right. Anyway, one day I received a call from a Paul Bushman. It seems he was one of ABC Auto Parts employees at the time. He explained he'd been watching Motorsports Unlimited for quite a while and thought we would be a good place for them to advertise. I explained we were a non-commercial public access cable show and unable to do traditional advertising. I also explained underwriting acknowledgments. And he felt the company he worked for would still be interested, but it would be a good idea if I paid them a visit. I thought so too. I knew if ABC Auto Parts was a big nationwide chain of auto parts stores, we wouldn't be a good match. Our motorsport girls would prevent that. I had learned in my years with United Airlines that big companies are ruled by executives who lived with the notion, don't make a mistake. What this meant was the original fire breathers who built the company had long since been replaced by executives building their careers, not the company. And the first rule of life in building a career in a big corporation for executives is don't make a mistake. And I knew our risk-taking motorsport girls would be a red flag at the first or second committee meeting. If not a red flag for a well-meaning middle manager who might find us a unique opportunity, it would certainly be red meat for his or her enemies looking to move up the corporate ladder over them. If ABC Auto Parts was a big company, I knew I'd be wasting my time. I went down there. Uh, I should explain, I'm a north sider and ABC headquarters was located on the south side. Chicago area people will understand what I'm saying. Anyway, I went down there, south, and my impression was surprise. ABC Auto Parts was not a traditional auto parts store. It was more like a junkyard, a big and fancy one to be sure, but not a shiny corporate chain type auto parts store. I went inside and found Paul Bushman. He gave me the lay of the land and introduced me to one of the owners, Jim. It seems ABC is a family owned and run company and I was talking to the son of the owner. He was a polished corporate kind of guy who didn't quite fit in, in my mind, but he was a nice enough guy who was working on ABC advertising at the moment. I observed he was working on ad copy for print media. I was encouraged that ABC Auto Parts was family owned, but I still wasn't sure how this was going to go over. After all, this was 30 years ago, and people barely knew what cable was, let alone public access cable. I gave Jim my speech about how we couldn't advertise, but we were allowed underwriting acknowledgments, and in these acknowledgments, we were allowed to display the corporate logo. As I was talking, I was looking around and could see this might work. From the layouts on Jim's desk, I could guess they did a lot of advertising and didn't have to depend on us to get their complete message out. I mean, I was probably self-serving, but I thought if they do other advertising telling people what ABC Auto Parts is, having ABC Auto Parts mentioned every day of the week on television could be very helpful to them. And we were cheap. While Paul and Jim and I were talking, an older man, uh, more my age, walked through the room. I could tell he was important by the way everyone reacted. He was dressed more like Paul, not buttoned down like Jim. More like someone who worked in the yard. They introduced me to him and his name was Jim too, except as it turned out, it was Jim Jr. <laughs> except the other Jim was already Jim Jr. <laughs> it's complicated, but it was, I was to learn that the older Jim Jr.'s father was Jim Sr. At first, when I heard they were both named Jim, I thought it would be easy for me to remember both named Jim. That didn't turn out to be accurate. I was mostly confused. While I could see the older Jim Jr.'s children were running the company, I could also see the older Jim Jr. was where the power was. The kids referred to him as the old man, but he was only a few years older than me. <laughs> that was discouraging. Of particular interest was a comment he made to his son, Jim Jr. He pointed to the ad papers on his desk and said, what I want to know is, how come we had to find this guy motioning toward me? He was obviously criticizing the ad agency for not bringing Motorsports Unlimited to their attention. I was impressed with his power of observation. He hadn't been there for the entire meeting, but in a few moments, he had a full grasp. It was obvious he was sharp and knew what he was doing. We made the deal, and as I was learning, as I was leaving, I met some of the rest of the family. From what I could see, there were mostly boys ranging in age from 20 to about 40. 
there was also a daughter who happened to be a knockout. I remember making a mental note to myself not to be eyeing her. Yes, she was very pretty, but the old axiom about not having your money and your honey come from the same place, well, you know the rest. She was also the company comptroller, and that meant she signed the checks. Mental message underlined. Some years later, I met her mother, and the daughter mirrored her. I could see where her good looks came from. Anyway, I left with the deal done. A Motorsports Unlimited uh, first. We actually had a little funding, and not a moment too soon, I might add. The ABC Auto Parts connection turned out to be a very good one in many unexpected ways. It seems the original Jim Sr. was the first generation of ABC Auto Parts. He started the company. His son, Jim Jr., now called the old man, took over the company when his father passed away. And Jim Jr., the old man, had been mentoring his children to eventually take over. The old man, and I mean that in the most affectionate way, I liked these people, all of them, still do, and I really liked the fact that ABC Auto Parts was indeed a true family company. Over time, I would learn, while the children, who were now adults, of course, did indeed run the day-to-day -day operations of the company, but the old man was the patriarch and still very much in control. Oddly, I thought, in the beginning, the old man spent most of his time in the yard. After I got to know them, I could tell he really enjoyed his work. He was there because he wanted to be, not because he had to be. As a matter of fact, they all seemed to enjoy their work, and it was my guess the old man had a special way of dealing with what could very well be family trouble with all of them working closely together. Somehow, he did it, and it worked well. ABC Auto Parts expanded several times during the 30 years they worked with us. Sadly, I haven't been there since I've been laid up several years, but I assume they're still doing well. It always bothered me that we couldn't do more for them. Just saying, this program made possible in part by support from ABC Auto Parts located in Blue Island, Illinois, sounded like they were just another auto parts store like Trax Auto or AutoZone, when the fact was they sold used auto parts. They disassembled, cataloged, and inventoried all the parts from the cars they dismantled, and that's what they sold. It made a lot of sense. Some things, new or used, didn't make any difference. Well, like a windshield. They were able to sell a used windshield for a third of the cost of a new one, and who cares if someone else looked through it before? I really don't think our underwriting acknowledgement clearly identified who and what they were, but it was all we were allowed to do. The best part was ABC Auto Parts had all the props we needed to explain automobiles to the public, and they were enthusiastic participants. They went through a bunch of work many times to help us demonstrate automobile principles. I remember on one occasion, I wanted to produce a show explaining rear-wheel drive cars and front-wheel drive cars. This was when the front-wheel drive thing was just getting started. They went through all the trouble of cutting up two appropriate cars in such a way we could, on camera, lift the body off the rear-wheel drive car, leaving its running gear on the floor, to show how the components were laid out and how they worked. Then, on camera, we lifted the body off the front-wheel drive car, leaving its running gear behind, and I explained how its components were arranged and how they worked. It was very effective. I knew it was effective when one of our motorsport girls said, do you mean if you spun the wheels on a front-wheel drive car, it would be the front wheels that spin? Exactly, I responded, and I could see by the looks on our motorsport girls' faces, they got it. This was only one example of the effort ABC Auto Parts went through to help us explain things automotive to the public. Those who know something about cars know how much work it was for ABC to help us with this explanation. There were really too many examples to list here, but over the years, they sure cut up a lot of cars for us. They turned out to be a very good fit for us, and I hope their participation helped them as much as it helped us. Okay. Back to my adventure with 501c3. I must admit, I was breathing a little easier now. At least we had a little bit coming in instead of everything going out. As I look back, this just-in-the-nick-of-time scenario would play itself out over and over again. Just about the time Chris and I would think we couldn't go on anymore, something would come along and save us. Of course, we didn't know it at the time, and it was nerve-wracking whether it was fighting to save public access cable television or struggling to keep Motorsports Unlimited going. It seemed we were always on the brink of financial disaster only to get some sort of reprieve at the last minute. It would have been a lot less stressful 
if we could have known in advance that a reprieve would be coming. <laughs> but I guess life doesn't work that way. In the moment we were happy about ABC, we received notice of being turned down for 501c3 status. It was both crushing and freeing at the same time. Sure, I was plenty pissed to learn the government was in control of what people were allowed to champion and really steamed that I wasn't going to be allowed to fight back at part of what was killing our community. At least I couldn't fight back with the tools they had to work with. But it sure didn't mean I wasn't going to fight. It did mean I was going to be forced to change tactics. I've already explained I didn't think our effort would be successful at attracting funding in the traditional path. You know, for example, appealing for grants from foundations. I also had had a number of conversations with other 501c3 groups who recommended I use their lawyers. Of course, I couldn't do that. I'd already spent all the money I had on the one I had. Still, I'd heard enough to know I might revisit this 501c3 thing at a later date. One comment I heard from one of the lawyers I talked to who represented 501c3 groups, a ham sandwich could get a 501c3 letter. Of course, he was making a reference to the old lawyer saying that a good prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich, meaning any good lawyer can do it. I knew it wasn't that easy, but I got his point. It shouldn't be this hard, and it really shouldn't be this hard. And don't think I wasn't stewing in my own juices watching 501c3 organizations operating multi-billion with a B, multi-billion dollar operations in the sports entertainment marketplace at the expense of legitimate competitors. Oh, I was plenty pissed. But it was apparent I couldn't waste any more time chasing something that may or may not prove fruitful and miss the opportunity available for the time being on public access cable television. I didn't like the idea of pushing 501c3 aside even for the moment because I did think it was important, but using public access cable television while it was still here was more important at this moment in time. The ABC success had taught me there was another way to fund these efforts and while I knew with this method I could never even begin to raise the kind of money it takes to take a case to the Supreme Court, I was quite sure, unless I'd completely misjudged the broadcast industry, the only solution to the problem was going to have to come from the Supreme Court. But that was a long way off. At this moment, this was nearly 30 years ago, my immediate problem was taking advantage of public access cable television and the opportunity to get our message across. We were registered as a nonprofit charitable trust and operated as not-for-profit, although in truth we were a constantly losing money organization. But they really didn't have a category for that. An entity either had to be for-profit or not-for-profit. There didn't seem to be a way to indicate losing one's butt organization. For the moment, the big advantage of 501c3 was out of reach, but our work could continue. The ABC experience had shown a path in which we could hang on by our fingertips. No, we couldn't approach foundations for financing or offer tax-exempt donations, but we could do everything else, and I was increasingly uneasy about the future of public access cable television. I decided for the time being all of our efforts would have to be devoted to raising public consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of the motorsport community and its activities via public access cable television. It seemed to be the only tool available at the moment, and its survival was questionable. It was clear to me, at this point, 501c3 had become a plaything of the wealthy, and I would need to acquire someone or something with deep pockets in order to pursue it. I thought it was sad at the time, but looking back, I can see my little $500 effort was hopelessly inadequate and a complete rethink was going to be necessary. I knew 501c3 didn't start out that way, but that's what it had become. Oh, an interesting side note. A few months after we received our 501c3 denial, we received an unmarked, plain white business envelope with no return address. It looked a little odd, so I opened it carefully. Inside, there was only a small newspaper clipping, torn, not cut, out of a newspaper. It was a public notice that the lawyer who'd been handling our 501c3 application had been disbarred. I looked at it and thought, I sure know how to pick them. I've often wondered who sent the clipping to me. No one else knew anything about our work to acquire 501c3 status. It, it wasn't a secret. I mean, come on, it's not, just not the kind of thing that folks like us talk about. I wouldn't have known what 501c3 was if I hadn't been digging into this college sports thing. It certainly isn't the kind of thing that would interest anyone I knew, <laughs> including me. It's the kind of thing you only know about if you have to. 
The only one I could think of was the receptionist in the now-closed lawyer's office. During my many visits there trying to get him going, we got to know each other a little bit. I think she actually felt a little sorry for me. She knew stuff I didn't know, like what he said he'd done and hadn't even started. I was there a lot. I suppose it was possible it was her being kind, trying to soothe my wounds, so to speak. I don't have an ending for this. I never found out who sent it, and it really wasn't important. What was done was done, and producing a new one-hour show every week kept me hopping. I had to move on. Enough time and energy had already been wasted on this stuff. My life wasn't about acquiring 501c3 status. It was about saving motorsport. I had to use the tools available to me. Sort of a play the cards that you're dealt, not the ones you wish you had kind of thing. I wasn't about to waste another year chasing down any more rabbit holes. I had work to do, and time was a-wasting. Ah, speaking of time, it's happening again. We're running out of time, and I promised at the beginning of this show I was going to show you where the money was and how to find it. To refresh your memory, briefly, it is our premise the motorsport community has been cheated out of a fair opportunity to compete for public attention in the sports entertainment marketplace. In order for any entity to survive in a capitalist society, one must generate enough revenue to fund itself and flourish. If they fail to do this, they will die, as is evidenced by the near death of motorsport in America, presently sustained only by devoted followers and heroic efforts. Certainly not a business model for a real future. If you're following me so far, the question should be, okay, wise guy, if we're going to survive, where is the money? Are you ready? Here it is. That's right. What you've been looking for is hiding right in front of you in plain sight. There are billions, with a B, billions to be made in the sports entertainment marketplace. So, now the question is, how do we get it? You compete for it. It's no secret. I'm surprised I have to tell such a competitive group what you have to do to compete. Oh, I know I don't have to say anything about presentation. The motorsport community is outstanding at presentation. I mean, the colorful cars, motorcycles, boats, snowmobiles, aircraft, and all the rest are delights to the eye. Motorsports Unlimited has presented many programs about the incredibly talented motorsport artists who create the graphics and paint schemes that adorn the vehicles with which we compete. Not to mention colorful, tasteful team uniforms. No, presentation isn't our problem competing. It's the other part of competing where we fail so miserably. We fail to make sure that we are competing on a level playing field. We absolutely, positively cannot allow our competitors for public attention to dominate the public consciousness through television. One thing you are going to hear me hammer away at is television. Television. Nothing else is important. It must be watched continuously, and I don't mean watched as in viewing, I mean watched as in monitored. I mentioned a couple of times earlier in this explanation series, one cannot successfully introduce a new product into the marketplace without television time. One cannot successfully run for significant political office without television time. Think about that. Think about the power television has over our culture. It is in a position to select our nation's leaders, to influence what we do for entertainment. It determines what music is popular and so much more. Perhaps most important, television determines normalcy. For example, I've watched over the years as we've come to accept, culturally, the notion that it takes two paychecks to support a modest home and middle class lifestyle. It wasn't always that way. As I keep saying, I'm old enough to remember before there was television. I can tell you in the early 50s it was quite possible for an average man with an average job to afford a modest home for his family, perhaps a new car every two or three years. I'm not talking about CEOs or doctors or lawyers. I'm talking about punch press operators, street sweeper drivers, construction laborers, average jobs held by average people raising average families. So what happened? Why does this reality now take two incomes? Two things. First, World War II. During World War II, most of the able-bodied American males were off fighting the war. This necessitated a need for the women left behind to go into the factories and build the machinery needed to support the war. When the war was over and the men returned, with the women in the workplace, there was a huge expansion in the workforce, and that reduced the value of labor. Second. 
television was emerging as an influence in American life. The devaluation of labor served corporate interests, and from the beginning, corporate interests dictated television's presentation. Oh, it didn't happen instantaneously. It took several years, but slowly, women were being convinced there was a Disneyland in the workplace, and raising a family was beneath them. Decades into this change, the notion of publicly funded daycare became a reality, and the need for public funds to provide daycare became a popular television theme. I mean, how else could we keep women in the workforce, keeping the labor rate down, if they had to bother with raising their families? Television had convinced us that a woman would be, should be more than a homemaker, like somehow delivering mail or working on an assembly line is more. I watched it happen. But I must admit, I am surprised by how quickly we human beings discard and ignore our own instincts. I've often said I think cats have better instincts than humans. Try going after a mother cat's kittens or a mother bear's cubs, and you'll see what I mean. We humans have been persuaded it's a good idea for a mother to go into the workplace and have strangers care for her children. We ought to be outraged, yet we calmly discuss practical methods of daycare. Here's an idea. How about mothers raise their children? Mothers who have an average husband with an average job making enough money to support his family in middle class fashion. Of course, that can't happen with an overabundance of people in the workplace. This inevitably reduces the wages in that workplace. It's simple math. If corporations can get both the husband and the wife in the workplace, they will pay each of them half. Maybe not right away, but it's inevitable. Okay, okay. This is a deep, complicated subject, and I'm greatly oversimplifying. There are many reasons why a woman might want or have to leave her children and enter the workplace, and we simply must come up with a way for women with children but no husband to support a middle-class lifestyle. I'd be glad to discuss this in detail in another forum, but this isn't the place for it. The point I'm trying to make is television has enormous influence on our culture, including determining what is normal. We now think of it as normal for mothers to be in the workplace with strangers raising their children. I'm here to say it isn't normal. It happens, of course, but it isn't normal. The undeniable bond between a mother and her children is normal and shouldn't be dismissed as unimportant. One would think it shouldn't be necessary for someone to point out that raising the next generation may be the most important career a person can have, but here I am having to explain it. Switching gears. How about the oft-repeated on television statement that baseball is a national pastime? On the face of it, it's ridiculous. Baseball is a private business in operation to make a profit. As I said before, I've read the Constitution backwards and forwards, and there's no mention of baseball. Yet, television has influenced us so much, the oft-repeated notion, ridiculous though it may be, is a reality. People think it's true. They saw it on television. <sighs> There's more, of course. I ask you to think about it. Think about where your perceptions come from. What has influenced your opinions? In all likelihood, you will conclude television has played a major role in your thinking process. Try to remember, television is controlled and inhabited by wealthy, privileged corporations. Women in the workplace rarely find the alluded to, but never quite defined, career. Nor do men. We find jobs, jobs to support our families. It has been said most men lead lives of quiet desperation, meaning they find themselves in a job they neither hate nor love but tolerate to support their family. Sadly, we can now assign that destiny to women too. The implied promise of a glamorous career exists for very few, yet we think it's within everyone's reach. It isn't. But as long as we keep everyone in the workplace, male and female, we keep the cost of labor down. Television preached it, and we bought it. Granted, this process began in the 50s, but it continues today. I'm watching television convince us you can't get a decent job of any kind or a job of any kind without college. It isn't true, but they present a compelling argument, and if they are the only ones who get to talk by law, it's pretty hard to resist spending your life savings getting your kids through college, or worse yet, the young people burdening themselves with lifelong debt because they just have to have the key to a big future, a college degree. It's a hoax, but you'll never hear a contrary argument on corporate controlled television. College has become big business. I ask you to ask yourself, who benefits from this? 
certainly not the people who will be bending under the staggering date for most, or debt for most of their adult life. If you think about it, you'll find only corporations benefit from reduced labor rates. It's strange for me, at 75 years of age, to watch America's middle class struggling to stay there on two paychecks when, for most of my early life, I saw the exact same middle class supported on one paycheck and mom staying home as a homemaker taking care of her family. Perhaps that's why we didn't have 13-year-olds shooting each other. Anyway, I'm not trying to start a political argument. I'm trying to point out close-to-home examples of television's influence on our lives and how it's done. Because understanding that is the key to understanding my effort to explain the loss of motorsport in America, the birthplace of the mighty auto industry. Hard to believe what has happened. But I watched it. And happened, it did. I'd like you to think about what I've said on this episode of Motorsports Unlimited while I prepare the material for the next episode, Explanation 11, when I'll go into this in more detail. What I'd like to know is, if you're watching this, you must be some kind of motorsport person. So, why aren't you mad? I don't get it. We'll talk more about that next time. Speaking of time, as always, we're out of time. I hope you'll think carefully about what I've said. I've shown you where your money is and talked a little bit about how to go after it. Trust me, no one will do it for you. If motorsport is going to survive as anything other than a hobby for the wealthy, you are going to have to do something. We'll talk more about that and much more next time. Right now, I want to take a moment to thank John Platania for helping me put these programs together despite my current disability. And to thank him, I just have to get a little bit of action footage on before we close. That always makes him happy. Oh, while you're watching, please don't forget about the question I just asked and want you to ponder until next time. Given that I've gone into great detail about how you've been cheated out of a fair opportunity to compete for public attention, why aren't you angry? Look at this, Hector getting the whole Thanks. shot. Orsini getting it off the line. Mad Mark leaving on a red. That don't matter, he's getting there first. Motorsports Unlimited is produced by Bill Wilt, president of the Motorsport Advancement Crusade. This program made possible in part by support from Jimmy's Red Hots, located on Grand Avenue and Pulaski Road in Chicago. Motorsports Unlimited was created to raise public consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of the motorsport community and their activities. You can contact us by email at msutv.com or email us directly at msutv at aol.com. We enjoy hearing from our audience and encourage you to let us know what you think. Now this is not one of our usual next weeks promoting next week's program. This is a reminder that Motorsports Unlimited is now global on YouTube. Simply subscribe to Bill Wilt Motorsports Unlimited on YouTube and watch us anytime. So that's it, another edition of Motorsports Unlimited and the lovely ladies of motorsports. And be with us next week because we'll have something real exciting. Bill Wilt's going to have the lovely ladies and just about anything can happen right here on Motorsports Unlimited. Every week at this time, we bring you the best in motorsports. So uh, be seeing you. Bye-bye. And... Uh, Keep on rocking.